Dr. Cherry, thank you for those warm words. And uh, thanks to all of you for your regular attendance and your support of this lectureship. Uh, I have to say that the combination of uh, physical and geographical beauty uh, and of spiritual commitment and of Nova Scotian hospitality that I've experienced in this place is overwhelming. Uh, I'm tempted to call my secretary and uh, say, see you in a couple of months. I, I, I think when it gets a little colder, uh, that California may look better to me than it does right now. But uh, apart from the need for reunion with my wife and family, uh, I'd be very happy to stay in, in Nova Scotia for a longer uh, tenure. This has been a lovely experience for me. We look tonight at the quest for freedom. And we remind ourselves that every society has them and every society needs them. The wise, they're observers and organizers of life. Part scientist, part philosopher, they watch how experience works and draw their conclusions from it. The proverb is their standard form of communication. Those memorable sayings, short, terse, tangy. As one scholar has uh, described them, the wisdom of many and the wit of one. The cumulative wisdom of society that makes its observations and then that unusually gifted person who has the ability to take that experience and to encapsulate it in a form that everyone else remembers. An eye on life and an ear for sound. That's the stuff that makes for Proverbs. Not very different from part of what makes for good preaching, good teaching. Simplification with Proverbs is unavoidable. It's part of the genre. The Proverbs make no attempt to harmonize one with the other. They do not try to put all of life in a systematic uh, structure. Rather, the focus is on the discovery of specific and evident rules for success. Proverbs may even seem contradictory because they generalize different sets of data. Uh, I have no doubt that uh, it's possible, though I haven't checked this with them for accuracy, that in principal McRae's home, he was told regularly, penny wise, pound foolish. <laughs> but Mrs. McRae in her home was told, mind the pence and the pounds will take care of themselves. Now I ask you, which do you do? either under the old uh, and deeply lamented LSD or the new pence that uh, have tried to simplify the currency system in Great Britain. Do you say penny wise, pound foolish, as though you've got to get the big picture and never mind the details, or do you say mind the pence, that is the details, and somehow the pounds will take care of themselves? Those are opposite sayings built on the same currency system, ingrained into the lives of children in the United Kingdom. Or in the book of Proverbs we read, answer a fool according to his folly. And very near it in the text, do not answer a fool according to his folly. Okay? Put both of those on the wall of the bedroom. <laughs> The emphasis was with the, with the wall, not the locale. <laughs> but the point is that both statements are valid depending on the specific data which gave rise to them. Painful lessons, Proverbs are. Now you cannot imagine Adam and Eve in the garden saying to themselves, dear, let's coin for each other some proverbs. 
Proverbs are not coined beforehand. Each is based on a long history of failure and success. Can you imagine how many moments of embarrassment there were for various people before someone said, a stitch in time saves nine. <laughs> As Professor von Rath has said, every proverb is a case of locking the stable door after the horse is stolen. <laughs> because proverbs are generalizations, oversimplifications, they gave rise to a literature which called them into question. Another later set of the wise arched their eyebrows at the traditional sayings and warned their pupils about the dangers of such simplicity. Using the same basic, basic methods, that is an eye for experience and an ear for expression, they majored not in the rules but in the exceptions. And for them, the exceptions virtually became the rules. Older wise and younger wise. These are shorthand terms because as a matter of fact, there's lots of evidence in ancient literature that skeptics existed early in the history of Egypt and Mesopotamia both. There's a whole literature of questioning which exists side by side in Middle Eastern middle lit uh, wisdom literature with a literature of success literature of questioning, literature of success. In any given culture, the literature of success uh, may have come first, but right along with it, in parallel pattern, the literature of question or protest. The rules are laid down and lived with a while, and then the doubts are posed. But that goes way back in human history. And there's nothing that I would base the date of Kohelethon from the standpoint of skepticism is late. Skepticism is very early as a genre. The arguments for the date of Koheleth, putting him at the end of the Persian period or at the beginning of the Greek Seleucid period, as I have, are arguments based on the nature of language and the, and the way in which the biblical faith is dealt with, not that skepticism comes late or we only learned it from the Greeks because as a matter of fact uh, we have examples of it that will go back well into the second millennium BC. We sketched the outlook last night of the older wise. They talked about a life filled with meaning. There's profit in work, they said. There's meaning to creation. They even studied the habits of plants and animals for lessons in life. They drew analogies between what God was doing in nature and what God was doing in grace. They said there was direction to history. The past was remembered and built on. The future was awaited and counted on. And then we outlined the counter wisdom of the younger wise man. A verdict of futility. He said, you have all that work and no profit. You have creation that's lost its meaning, locked into the endless weary routines. You have history without direction. Nothing new to be looked for, nothing old worth remembering. All this that the younger wise man said is a basic disruption of the biblical view of life. And yet here it is in our Bible. And the tension continues. The tension between the conventional wise and the radical wise. It continues tonight for us with the question of freedom. As the tension continues, so does our need to move beyond the tension, beyond the older wise and the younger wise to the greater wise one. He taught us profit in work, we saw last night, and in the work beyond work doing God's will. He taught us about meaning and creation, the importance and goodness of our material world. And the creation beyond the creation, the new creation which anticipates the renewal of all things. He said there was direction to history and opened up for us the meaning of history beyond history, the history which has as its goal the till I come of the communion table. Tonight, we'll find that our quest for freedom 
like our drive for profit and meaning, must find its rest in him. But we begin with the older wise. Contribute to your own destiny was their advice to their spiritual daughters and sons. The practitioners of the art of success, these wise were, advocates of the law of causality. Each cause has appropriate effects. Discover this relationship and you have the key to success. Do right things and you're assured right results. Naturally, they espoused a strong view of our human ability to contribute to our human destiny. One of the things that you'll see as you read, uh, as you read the Proverbs is that the kind of understanding that you and I would have from a New Testament perspective of the depravity of the human family and the fact that sin has deprived us of, uh, of the right of free choice that we have to have the intervention of the Holy Spirit and the, and the teaching of the Word for there to be that power to choose the right. Uh, all of that was theologically more complex uh, than, than the view of life they dealt with. They assumed that when wisdom called, you had the power to answer. They, had the, they assumed that when folly called, you had the power to say no to folly's invitation and that uh, there was a direct relationship between the way God worked in life and the freedom that he gave us to make the right choices. All of their thinking assumed large doses of human freedom. They said, lay bare the principles of life and head in their direction. They said, conform your lives to them. You are free to choose the right. Now do it. And they pounded home the importance of hard work, for instance, as an expression of this freedom. A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. A son who in summer is prudent a son who gathers in summer is prudent, but a son who sleeps in harvest brings shame. And they pressed hard for the importance of sound choices. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. Or again, without counsel, plans go wrong, but with many advisors, they succeed. Plans are established by counsel. We can make the right choices. By wise guidance, wage war. Still, they did not overreach. Measured humility in the Proverbs was part of their wisdom, too. We read, for instance, many are the plans in the mind of man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will be established. God's will ultimately being done despite the nature of our human planning. Yet the strong themes of their advice are plain, even with an, uh, an occasional caveat. Contribute to your destiny, they said, by diligence and discernment. God has given you full freedom so to do. Now the counterjudgment came from the younger wise man, Ecclesiastes. And that counter judgment is this submit to God's determinations. That's another thing from shape your own destiny by your own free choice. Submit, he says, to God's determinations. Remember that the basic theme of Koheleth is the futility of all things. That's his way of saying that traditional values cannot be counted on as heavily as some have deemed. Remember that there's no systematic plot or dramatic movement to the book. It's rather a case of restatement by creative repetition. Now, you'll think that's a foreign thing if I tell you that that's a characteristic Hebrew mo mode of arguing. But if I tell you that that's a mode understood by anyone whose 16-year-old kid has, has mustered a series of ideas as to why he should have his own car, no logic to the argument, and the argument does not proceed along any planned course. 
It is, just, it is just argued day after day from every possible angle. You knew what the argument was when it was started, when it began. And that argument then is, is reinforced by creative repetition, uh, angle after angle of looking at it. Precisely the way a teenager would argue with parents is the way Kohelet develops the theme of, uh, of his book. Let me uh, read for you the famous poem in chapter 3, one of the great and powerful poems of the scripture. I'm reading at this time the first eight verses. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. Which I think is interpreted by this next line. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. I think the casting of stones has to do with sexual intercourse and the emission of semen. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Now the terseness of that passage, each line of which in, in the contrast just tends to be two Hebrew words, each half of the contrast. The terseness of that has not made it easy for us to interpret. Some of the things are more clear than others. As a matter of fact, the mood of it has been difficult for us to catch. And were it not for its context, we could bring other interpretations to it uh, than the one that I'm bringing tonight. And there are people who know its context and still will bring you other interpretations than I bring tonight. But the interpretation that I want to, that I want to focus on tonight as an interpretation that says we are dealing in our choices about what to do with a timing that God has planned, that God has determined. I think I can argue for this from the wording of the, of the first verse. See, if, if he were arguing that there's a right time for you to do things and you find the right time and do them, he would not start by saying there's a time to be born and a time to die because I don't care how clever you are and what honors with what honors you have graduated from this very distinguished uh, university you do not have the option of planning the time to be born and only under the most bizarre circumstances the option of planning the time of your death. He is not saying make the right choices at the right time. He is saying, as a matter of fact, the times are not in your hands, but are in God's hands. And it is he who determined the time of your birth and will determine the time of your death, along with all of these other experiences which are laid out. You see, part of what inhibits our freedom, part of his argumentation against the Proverbs who are, who are saying, just make the right choices and you will change your own life and you will change society and you will do all kinds of good things for yourself and for others. That's the mood of much of the book of Proverbs. Ecclesiastes says in effect, oh yes, that's not the world that I know. In the world that I know, a great many of the most basic things that happen are beyond human timing. What we do is submit to God's determination, his planned time. 
Earlier wisdom was founded, as Professor Crenshaw reminds us, on the conviction that one could discern the right deed for the occasion. And to that, Kohelet says, no. That God's determined times are as fixed as birth and death. They're beyond our choice or our contribution. And this is true throughout the whole range of life. Notice that the, the sweep of the topics covered, uh, basic topics of, of, of building and planting and uh, waging war and seeking peace, weeping, laughing, mourning, dancing, making love, not making love, keeping silence, speaking. They're beyond our choice or our contribution. And there's a sweep of topics covered with a great variety, as the sharpest contrasts point out. Now, you remember the literary form that you see uh, if you read a phrase like the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The good and evil are, are opposites. The poles are set up in that passage in a literary fashion, not only to cover the poles, but to cover the whole range of reality in between. People who know literature uh, the, the eagles in your English department at this university will call that merism, M-E-R-I-S-M, -E as a literary device, in which you set up the extremes in order to cover the whole range of reality. You say, from the least to the greatest. Or you say, come, young and old. Now, you don't mean just uh, under 18 and over 65. But come, young and old, covers the whole range. And so in each of these areas, there is not only the poles that are set up, but the whole range of activities in whatever category that is, that are being covered as under the hand of the sovereign God and beyond the range of our basic human choices to, uh, to deal with. So we have, our, we have God's planned time and we have our frustrating restrictions as ways that freedom is hedged. Notice the key verse in 9 at the close of that beautiful poem, the rhetorical question with which he brings that to a climax is what gain has the worker from his toil? Now when the question is posed that way, the only possible answer that the author expects is the answer, no, none. What gain? None. He's not asking an unrigged question. He is forcing us to face the emptiness of our work given the fact that we cannot influence it a great deal because of his understanding of the way in which the sovereignty of God determines human freedom. We have to work he tells us that we ought to work and enjoy it as best we can. But he says we cannot expect our work to change very much. We have to do it, but it doesn't pay the dividends promised by the older wise. He also says that we are frustrated not only by the fact that there is no profit to our toil, but that we have no knowledge of the future and the way God works even though the thirst for that knowledge has been planted in us by the Creator's touch on our lives. You find this in verse 11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. We have a, a new gospel song with those, uh, with those words. Do you sing that in Canada? He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity into the human mind yet so that he cannot find out for the human being cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end our drive to find meaning in life is directly related theologically to our creation in the image of God we cannot live with meaninglessness we cannot live without purpose. You've been talking as part of the, uh, the Hayward Week about the church in China. 
If I understand a little bit about the growth of the house churches in the last couple of years, the most significant growth in the house churches has been in, in persons who are between uh, 18 and 30 years of age. People that, uh, uh, that whose, whose props have been knocked out from under them, first of all because the cultural revolution in China tended to undercut their Confucianist ideals. And then finally because the rejection of the cultural revolution beginning in 1978 in China left them both without the Confucianism which had been their traditional heritage for, for a great many centuries but also it left them without the kind of Maoism and Marxism uh, that had sustained the elan and the drive of the cultural revolution. And it's been out of the emptiness and out of the sense of meaninglessness and out of the need for purpose that these hundreds of thousands of Chinese young men and women, university age, slightly older, have committed themselves to Jesus Christ because he put that sense of eternity within us but not so that we could discover life's meaning on our own. And that's the bind that Koheleth analyzes for the human family. You see, that's why the, that's why the novelists and the playwrights are so magnificent at diagnosis and so impotent at prescription. That's why they can lay bare the human need with all of the skill of a surgeon who can cut right at the, at, the, at, the, at the correct place and make all of those incisions where they need to be made and then somehow has lost his needle when it comes to suturing up the incision. And that's precisely the dilemma with which Koheleth lives in his analysis of our human predicament. Frustration sharpened, our sense of vanity burgeoned. And as Professor Gordas, one of the great rabbinic students of wisdom literature says, what might have been a justification of the ways of God, this talk about the times and the seasons, becomes a lament on the ignorance of man. That's where we are. Now, I want to say that the, that the pup that we have at home in Pasadena, who will greet me with a great delight when I arrive home, and it doesn't matter if I'm gone five minutes or one week, I get the same joyful delight because puppies have no sense of time, apparently. I get the same greeting. That dog has no concern whatsoever about meaning in life. The, 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 the search for purpose, the wrestling with these issues is something that her master understands. You remember how, 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 how Burns reflected upon that when his, when his plow blade snipped at the mouse's nest and he talked about the best laid plans of mice and men after gang a glay and leave us not grief and pain for promised joy. Then what did he go on to say? Still thou art blessed compared with me. The present, that's where my dog lives. That's where the mouse lives. The present only toucheth thee. But ach, I backward cast my e on prospects drear, and forward though I cannot see, Burns said, I guess and fear. That's the way we live as human beings, different from the mouse because of those dimensions of time. We cannot discern either the beginning or the ending of God's plan, but we know that something is there that makes us different from the mouse. And how do we have freedom? Living within those limitations. It's so constricted 
We are so locked into a system determined by God that the best we can do is eat, drink, and enjoy happiness in our work. Our freedom is not worth hoping for, especially the freedom that the wise men told us that we have to make things different in our life and in society. What we can do, says the wise man in his conclusion, and it's got a lot in it to commend itself, is to appreciate God's grace as it comes in the supply of our basic needs. And to make the best of such gifts, he calls them. The Hebrew verb natan, gave, 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 punctuates the text of Kohelet. That theme of modest, temperate, measurable, but enjoyable grace. We have to see all of these, drink, work, love, food, not as rewards for our diligence, as the older wise may have seen them, but as gifts to be gratefully received from the hand of God by people who don't have a great deal of freedom to make any change. Every society has them and needs them. The wise who urge us to get on with our destiny and contribute to it, and the other wise who remind us of God's mysterious governance and the ways in which we must reckon with it. We see a lot of this struggle in our own generation. We see the efforts of, of our humanity to grapple with the meaning of our freedom. Sammy Davis Jr. perhaps tonight singing in a Las Vegas nightclub. Sweat standing fresh on his brow, circles of gold chains around his neck microphone before him, I've got to be me. Frank Sinatra in Madison Square Garden with 25,000 people cheering, talking about all the obstacles that he had to overcome and all the rough roads that he had to, uh, to, to travel and all the advice that people tried to lay on him that he disregarded and coming to that great climax of that song to the, to the rousing cheers of that multitude when he says, I did it my way. The arrogant quest for human freedom on the one hand, saying much more than can, we can possibly achieve as human beings, boasting in ways that are to shame us if we really ask ourselves, is that true? Or fatalistic songs, on the other hand, bending, broken, before the wheel of reality, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to see, que sera. Sarah. We need more. We can't just sing either the arrogant songs or the fatalistic songs and live with ourselves as human beings. There's no freedom that way. There's no freedom in either of those roots. We need more. And we must go beyond the approach of the younger wise and the older wise and beyond the songs of our own society. beyond to the greater wise one, to the one in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge, the one in whom we find completeness and full freedom. We hear the words of this greater wise man who says to us, find freedom through trust. Find freedom through trust. If the Son has made you free, 
you shall be free indeed. He takes up where the others left off, while supporting much of what the earlier sages have said. The children of the kingdom do plan ahead, he says. They do count the cost before they build a tower. They do believe that their efforts make a difference, that they do have good works which glorify their Father who is in heaven. He's like the older sages in what he says about that. And the greater sage also affirms the simple joys of life. He doesn't quote Koheleth when he says that in saying that eating and drinking and working are all there are, but he does eat and with gusto he does drink with his friends and with delight. He does work and with joy and purpose. At times to the chagrin of his critics did he enter in to the good things of life. Christ was no bore at a party. But more importantly, he offers a deeper, higher freedom. He offers a freedom to accept life as God gives it. There I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor about your body, what you shall put on. Look at the birds of the air. Your heavenly Father feeds them. Look at the lilies of the field. Your heavenly Father clothes them. And he offers freedom from anxiety and greed. He has more optimism than the preacher because he knows the giver better. He knows in a deeper way the meaning of grace, even though that divine grace is a major motif, as I have said, in the thinking and writing of Kohelet. Christ shows how grandly God can be trusted. And he offers a freedom to affirm God's direction in history. He demonstrates that freedom by his view of time, which is focused on an hour. An hour that symbolized God's mastery of history for the purpose of redemption. Christ is always heading for that hour, particularly in John's Gospel. That hour also symbolized Christ's own submission to the Father's freedom to set the times and the seasons. Koheleth is saying we have to accept, tough as it may be, this determinism of the sovereignty of God. Jesus is saying, in effect, I delight to do your will. I submit gladly to that sovereignty, even though for, it mean, for me it means that the hour is coming in which history's meaning, meaning is made pregnant with significance. For the rest of us. And Christ makes possible not only a freedom from anxiety and from greed, not only a freedom to affirm God's direction in history, but a freedom from law as he teaches us to trust God's provision of salvation by grace, a gift freely given and freely received by faith. He also urges us to a freedom to alter society as God enables. Kohelet said you cannot bring change, in effect, because of the sovereignty of God. Jesus says because God is freely sovereign and in his sovereignty offers you opportunity to trust and obey, you can bring change by the expression of your freedom. What a contrast this is from Kohelet's despair about the possibilities of real change. And this freedom comes to us, this freedom from slavery, and sets us free to love and contribute to the lives of others by, their, by our good works. Christ invites us as his people to nothing less than helping God in his program of the reshaping of human history. In short, this master sage puts the whole question of freedom in perspective for us. Our human lust for freedom in Edom's garden 
brought loss of freedom for the whole course of human history. Koheleth missed the point, in part at least. The problem in freedom is not determinism on God's part, but rebellion on ours. A rebellion in which we forfeited our human freedom, which is the freedom to be what God wanted us to be. We know that theologically, full freedom is freedom to do the Father's bidding, to be what he would have us be. Christ's freedom, then, is freedom to be human under God. It is freedom in the servant model. It is the freedom to go back to the figure of Koheleth, to understand that he has placed eternity within us, and that because of the revelation in Christ, we can understand what God is doing in its major outlines from beginning to end. And that understanding that we gain not through empirical observation, but through the mysteries of divine revelation in Christ, that freedom sets us free to be part of that end to beginning process. It is freedom in the servant mold. You sing that hymn, Make Me a Captive, Lord, and Then I Shall Be Free. That's your song. Teach me to render up my sword, and I shall conquer or be. Such servant freedom, such freeing service, is not found in learning alone. All right to talk about that in this auditorium? Not found in learning alone. That's why the earlier sages, both the dogmaticians and the protesters, could not achieve the level of freedom known to the sons and daughters of God through Jesus Christ. The practitioners of proverbial wisdom overplayed the hand of freedom. Flip up the right card, they taught, and your trump will take every trick in life. The purveyors of radical wisdom, like Ecclesiastes, assume no such freedom. They said the deck is stacked to begin with, and we don't really know what the game's rules are anyway. More than learning is necessary for true freedom. It has to begin with forgiveness. Forgiveness for our failure to deal with freedom responsibly. Forgiveness for the use of our freedom to flee from God. Forgiveness for abusing the freedom of others by our selfishness and our lack of love. The importance of forgiveness, central to our understanding of what it means to be human and how we, cover, how we recover the fullness of that humanity. The importance of forgiveness as a key to freedom was beyond the province of the wise. They had no way of getting at it in its deepest dimensions. Only the greater wise one grasped this truth and laid down his life for it. You see, when it came to teaching about freedom, it was not enough for him to be our sage he had also to become our savior. Thank you.